Hello, hello everybody, this is TipTopMTG here today with another Magic the Gathering video. In today's video, we are taking a look at Magic's upcoming set, Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, which for the remainder of this video I will be referring to as Forgotten Realms. So essentially, we are going to be talking about a bunch of the spoilers that came out today. Now, in the past, I've tried to cover every spoiler that comes out every day, including every common, whether it's a 2-2 two -two for 2 or something really, really complicated. And I feel like it created a negative user experience as there were a lot of cards you didn't care about. And it created a negative content creator experience for me where I was putting in all this time for something that actually detracted from the video. So in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the rares, mythics, legendary creatures, and any other cards I found interesting. So if there are any commons or uncommons that I thought were really cool from Dungeons and Dragons, uh, or sorry, Forgotten Realms. That's, I'm not calling Dungeons and Dragons, I'm calling it Forgotten Realms. Uh, so let's just jump right into this, talking about the Book of Vile Darkness. It's black, black, black for a legendary artifact, and it says, at the beginning of your end step, if you lost two or more life this turn, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. All right, so that's a pretty decent effect. I mean, shock in a shock land, get a 2-2 zombie. Uh, of course, this is only on your end step, so you need some way to damage yourself on your turn, uh, which can be a little bit more tricky. It's not like, oh, your opponent's attacked you, you get a zombie. So that does definitely limit it. It's also legendary, which is uh, not my favorite, but you can tap it and exile it and artifacts you control named Eye of Ve Vexna and Hand of Vesna. Uh, just, I want you guys to know, I do not play D&D, &D, do not know, and do not know how to pronounce everything, so, um, leave how you pronounce that in the comments down below. Either way, so then, when you do, you create Vesna, a legendary 8-8 black zombie god creature token with indestructible. It gains all triggered abilities of the exiled card. So, for, to kind of sum this up, you can kind of look at the top ability as the only actual ability of this card, but if you manage to get the Book of Vile Darkness... Eye of Vesna and Hand of Vecna, I'm going to say it differently every time, um, you can exile all three of them to create an indestructible 8-8 that then gains the abilities of all those cards. So as of now, we only have the Book of Vile Darkness, but for reference, it would be an 8-8 Black Zombie God uh, with indestructible and at the beginning of your end step, if you lost two or more life this turn, create a 2-2 two, two Black Zombie Creature token and whatever um, Eye of Vecna does or and whatever Hand of Vecna does. So it'll be this 8-8 that's indestructible and has all of these awesome abilities. Big issue here is they are legendary, so in a deck, you're trying to build kind of if you're trying to build around this idea of getting out this zombie god you need to kind of include four of each of these because your whole the whole point of your deck is that you get all four of the or sorry all three of the cards together but the issue is they're legendary and so maybe you put in three of each or even two of each but then at that point the odds that you're gonna run into all three pieces is getting pretty low so I do think the fact that it's legendary is a little bit interesting. However, if you do get all three out and then make the 8-8, you can then play another Book of Vile Darkness. You can't use the ability again because it'll create a legendary 8-8. Um, however, you can have the legendary 8-8 and then each of the three pieces out and you kind of get double the effect. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, you really can't judge the power level of this card without seeing the other two. Next, we have Werewolf Pack Leader. It's green green for a creature, human werewolf 3-3 with pack tactics. It says whenever it attacks, if you attacked with creatures with total power 6 or greater, this combat draws card. So first off, that's pretty good. I mean, this is a 3-3 for 2 that can draw you a card if you're attacking with enough creatures. Which, by the way, it is not that hard to attack with this creature and then something else with 3 power. And then you can pay four, and until end of turn, it becomes a 5-3, gains trample, and isn't a human. So essentially, it becomes a werewolf until end of turn, that's a 5-3 trample. So this is a lot. Honestly, I could see this being slotted into a lot of standard mono green decks, maybe even historic mono green decks. However, you'll notice we have this pack tactics kind of ability. And I actually did a whole video covering this earlier. Uh, they are called flavor words, so... They're both flavor words and not flavor words. There are multiple instances of pack tactics, and it's, I'm not clear whether this is like its own separate mechanic or they're calling it flavor words, but essentially flavor words are like, they're giving you names for the card choices that you make. So I, I don't know, This they've made it a little bit confusing with the mechanics here, but note pack tactics does show up on a lot of these, but you'll notice there's lots of little one-off italicized things as we go through these spoilers. Um... 
So it's almost just adding flavor to the card. So the fact that it says pack tactics does not mean anything other than, you know, it's flavorful. It's letting you know why it has this ability. And we'll see that in a couple other cards. For instance, this one. You find the villain's layer. So this is this is exactly what they were talking about in the mechanics article, which is these flavor words. So choose one, and you can either choose to foil their scheme or learn their secrets. But really, you're just choosing one counter target spell or draw two cards, then discard two cards. So, you know, this is we'll talk about the card individually. The words don't really mean anything. They are literally just there for flavor. And so I'm unclear whether Pack Tactics is one of those mechanics that is actually going to be seen on a decent amount of cards throughout the set, or if it's just a flavor word that happens to be on multiple cards. It'll be interesting to see, and I think we run into the other Pack Tactic one later on uh, in this video. But either way, let's talk about you find the villain's lair. So this is a three-cost instant. And you can either foil their scheme, which means you counter target spell, or learn their secrets, which means you draw two cards, then discard two cards. So, all right, this is a very powerful card in my opinion. So maybe not in the older formats where three mana counter spells aren't great, but we, when we look at standard and what makes a good counter spell, cancel is not a good counter spell. Why? Because there are literally just better cards than it. But, you know, what are our best counter spells? We have counter target spell, and you can cycle it for two mana. Counter target spell, and this is going to historic, surveil one. You know, there are all these counter target spells for three mana, one blue blue, and then just some side little effect. Or maybe they are, they cost less and they only counter non-creature spells. This counters anything. And yes, you are not getting a side effect like surveilling, but you also have this option to draw two cards and then discard two, meaning maybe you only have counter spells or maybe you're really missing your land drop. This card can come in as both a card draw engine and a counter spell. And I think combo decks are going to love this. You can either dig for your combo or protect your combo with the same card. So I think this is a very, very powerful card card uh in the more recent you know history of magic um you know it is obviously a common it can only be so powerful really um but i do think this is one of the better counter spells we've had in standard recently just because of its modality i mean there are games where i'm like well you know you're playing a bunch of two drops do i really care about counter spelling those maybe maybe it's a luminar gas print and i do care about counter spelling those but uh you might want to instead learn their secrets so i think this is one of the better cards we've seen so far even comparing it to some of the higher rarity cards i think this one could actually see a decent amount of play next we have this card which can be translated into okri jelly it is x and a green for a creature ooze and it enters the battlefield with x plus one plus one counters on it so if you pay five mana into this you, it is entering as a four four and then it has divide so this is another one where it's like it's an italicized word kind of representing a mechanic but it is not like a mechanic that overarches over the set that we are aware of. So when it dies, if it had two or more plus one plus one counters, create a co token that's a copy of it at the beginning of the next end step. That token enters the battlefield with half those plus one plus one counters rounded down. So if this thing is a 6x and then it dies, it, instead you will then get a 3-3. Three, three. So it kind of halves itself. And by the way, it's creating a copy of it with this ability. So if it's an 8, cause, let's say it's an 8-8, eight, eight, it dies and becomes a 4-4, four, four. then it dies and becomes a 2-2, two, two. and then it dies and becomes a 1-1. One, one. So it's kind of this card that you can just keep like sacrificing, for instance. So I actually think this could be a pretty good card in like a Jund Sacrifice style of deck. It also is just this big creature that doesn't die to one removal spell so i think this is actually quite powerful in that it is resilient it's like a big creature is not always the best thing like i can have a 10 10 and it's not going to do much but if i have a 10 10 that can you know kind of get knocked down by kill spells rather than destroyed by kill spells that's a pretty powerful thing uh it'll be interesting to see whether you know this could just disin disincentivize people from destroying it it could do lots of little things and i think it could kind of influence the politics of a table if you're in a four player game or at least change your opponent's targeting in a two player one Next, we have Orb of Dragonkind. It's a one and a red artifact. You can pay one and tap to add two mana in any combination of colors. Spend this mana only to cast dragon spells or activate abilities of dragons. So this is essentially ramping. It turns one mana into two, but you can only use it for dragon spells. And then you can pay a red and tap and sacrifice it to look at the top seven cards of your library. You may reveal a dragon card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest of them on the bottom of your library in a random order. So it's kind of this ramp, 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 ramp until, hey, I don't 
don't need this anymore. I need card draw, sacrifice it, get the card draw. So this is kind of card draw and ramp in red, which is really, really good, but it is of course limited to kind of dra those dragon spells. Um, I think this is generally going to be a card played in dragon decks and not much else, which is completely fine. It's niche. It's not going to go in every deck and that is fine. Next, we have 50 feet of rope. Uh, so this is a one cost artifact. And so this one I really included here because it kind of has this modality kind of idea of it, but not on a like choose one spell. It's instead an artifact that has three different tap abilities. You can either tap and target wall can't block. Not that relevant. Pay three and tap and target creature doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. By the way, does not tap the creature. You still have to like get the creature tapped in some way, but yeah, that one's a little bit better, although for three mana, it's not great. Then you can pay four and tap and venture into the dungeon, activate only as a sorcery. I think if it didn't say activate only as a sorcery, this card would actually be amazing, but I just wanted to use this to kind of showcase the flavor words in a different kind of sense. I don't think this is that good, but I do think, you know, a repeatable pay four mana venture into the dungeon. Let's kind of take a look at what that can get you. Is there any effect on here that you would pay four mana for? All right, I'd maybe pay four mana for a... F I, actually, I definitely would pay four mana for a 4-4 four, four Black God Horror Creature token if it also didn't cost me a card. Like, it's not costing... Like, I wouldn't pay four mana and, you know, a card for a 4-4 four, four with Death Touch, probably. However, if I'm not actually using a card to do it, maybe. Uh, looking at this... I don't really see much I would pay for mana here. Maybe draw three cards and reveal them. You may cast one of them without paying its mana cost. I would definitely pay four mana for that. Um, but you'll notice you have to get through a lot to get there. And if, say, 50 feet of rope is your only way to venture into the dungeon, getting to that last part of Dungeon of the Mad Mage is... Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you need 28 mana to get to that ability. So I just... It doesn't seem that practical to me. It seems one of those, like things where you're like, oh, I guess I have no mana. I was going to use this for something else. Um, but you know, I guess I'll just use it to venture into the dungeon. So I don't necessarily think this is going to be that great. And it doesn't have to be. I just thought it'd be interesting to kind of, uh, look at this card from the perspective of the three different dungeons. Next, we have Grazalix, Illithid Scholar, sorry. It is a three cost blue legendary creature horror three, two. So three, two for three, not bad. Whenever a creature you control becomes blocked, you may return it to its owner's hand. Big thing here, may. You do not have to do this, meaning this is only upside. For instance, if you attack with a creature and they block and then do a combat trick or they double block, you can actually be like, hey, I'm actually just going to return this to my hand, which by the way, means that you then get its ETB triggers again. But let's say they say, eh, I don't want you bouncing that to your hand. Well, then whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, draw a card. So you can essentially say, hey, are you going to let me draw a card and deal damage to you, or are you going to let me, uh, you know, return a creature to my hand, which then may have an awesome ETB. Also, one thing to note, Grazalix can bounce itself, so if he attacks and then kind of gets in trouble, you can bounce him back to your hand and avoid paying commander attacks if you're a commander, or just um, be able to play him again, so it seems pretty good. Next, we have a Gelatinous Cube. It's two black black for a creature ooze for three with engulf. When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-ooze creature and opponent controls until it leaves the battlefield. So a 4-3 for four, four, that's going to exile something pretty good. Unfortunately, unlike something like Ravenous Chupacabra, the thing comes back once Gelatinous Cube leaves the battlefield. And then you can pay X and black and put target creature card with mana value X exiled with Gelatinous Cube into its owner's graveyard. So... You can essentially temporarily kill this thing and then later on decide to pay mana to then permanently kill it. You can kind of just dissolve or kind of condense the person into their graveyard. So it's temporary removal. So you can get a 4-3 for 4 that also gets rid of something and maybe they get it back uh, if they destroy Galatinus Cube. But if they don't, you can eventually decide to pay mana to put it into its own graveyard. This actually seems pretty good to me. I mean... A 4-3 for 4 that temporarily removes something doesn't seem bad. And the fact that then if you want to, if that thing is so awful, you can then, you know, dissolve it, that's even better. So I think this is a card that could see play. I mean, take a look at things like Luminarch Aspirant. Is that the right, the right one? I don't think that's the right one. Luminarch Aspirant isn't the one, the two drop that puts counters on things. I am being dumb. Uh, or is that the one that exiles? 
Uh, give me one second. I'm 99%. Either way, it's the three costs uh, that exile something, and when they kill it, it comes back as like a token. Uh, yeah, Luminarch Aspen is the two costs. I'm trying to think of Skyclave Apparition. That's it. Uh, sorry. you. It's a three drop. You put it down. Exile something temporarily. Actually, it exiles it permanently, and they get a token. So the question is, would you rather have that card where it instead gives them like a 4-4 four, four, if it was a 4 CMC thing versus this one that gives them their thing back? I do think the, you know... Skyclave Apparition is better. Uh, you know, it's not ever giving them their creature back. They get a 4-4, four, four, but that's not nearly as devastating as whatever 4 mana value thing they had, and you get the creature. So I do think that this has some advantages in some situations, but I think I generally prefer Skyclave Apparition, although it is in different colors. Next we have Choose Your Weapon. So this is two and a green for an instant, and this is an uncommon. You can choose one. Two Weapon Fighting, which is double target creature's power and toughness until end of turn, or Archery, this spell deals five damage to target creature with flying. This just seems really, really good to me. I mean, three mana at instant speed to double target creature's power can literally just be three mana I win the game. I mean, there have been times where I'm at 10 life, and I'm like, okay, well, whatever, I won't block your five power creature, but then now gets doubled it also doubles its toughness we have cards like this in red um where it will double the power but this is doubling both and then it also has this side mode of hey i can get rid of a creature with flying so i think this is actually a pretty interesting card i don't know if it'll necessarily see play but i think that the fact that you can add instant speed double something's power and toughness for just three mana seems pretty good to me um probably not in those older formats but again in the something like standard it seems pretty good Next, we have the Black Staff of Waterdeep. It's a blue legendary artifact one drop. You may choose not to untap it during your upkeep, or your, during your untap step, sorry. And then you can pay one in a blue and tap, and another target non-token artifact you control becomes a 4-4 artifact creature for as long as it remains tapped. Uh, it being the Black Staff of Waterdeep. Uh, activate only as a sorcery. So the idea here is that you can animate something for two mana, so three mana to make a 4-4 out of another artifact. But if you decide, hey, I'd rather turn something else into an artifact creature, or I'd rather turn, you know, just anything that isn't the current thing into an artifact, or I don't want the current thing to be an artifact creature. For instance, I plan on board wiping and I don't want to lose my artifact. You can choose to untap it. So I like effects that are temporary because they're modal. I mean, if this said until end of turn, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of interesting. You can make this thing a creature for as long as you want, or not for as long as you want, you can take it for the turn, and then the next turn choose a different one. But this almost works the same way, but can have that permanence of, hey, it's still a 4-4, four -four. Um, and so that means that you can kind of manipulate it like you would if it was an Intel end of turn effect, but being able to keep it around for longer than end of turn. Next, we have Cave of, Cave of the Frost Dragon. It's a land. If you control two or more other lands, it enters the battlefield tapped. You can have and add white, and you can pay five, and it becomes a 3-4 white dragon creature token with flying until end of turn. It's still a land. So this is part of a cycle. I'll talk about the cycle a little bit later, but I think a 3-4 with flying is not bad. I mean, you know, you do have to play this early, otherwise it enters the battlefield tapped, but I think in those monocolored decks, these can be some great inclusions. Next, we have Circle of Dreams Druid. It's a green, green, green creature, Elf Druid 2-1, and you can tap to add green for each creature you control, which is always going to be at least one because of Circle of Dream Druids, but honestly, this just seems like a powerhouse in green decks, and I think it'll see a lot of play in Brawl. Not so sure about standard. Three mana for a 2-1 just doesn't seem to be on curve. It seems like it might be a little actually weak, but if there are is a, if there is a green deck that relies on putting out lots of creatures, I could see this card being pretty big. Next, we have Treasure Chest, and I talked about this one uh, a little bit in my mechanics video, so we're going to kind of rush through it, but it's a three-cost artifact that lets you pay for and sack it to roll a d20, and depending on what you roll, you get different things. So if you roll a one, you get you lose three life. If you roll a two through nine, you create five treasure tokens. If you roll a ten through nineteen, which is what you're going to do a lot of the time, you're going to gain three life and draw three cards. And then if you roll a twenty, you get to search your library for an artifact card, um... You may put it onto the battlefield, otherwise put that card into your hand. Sorry, you may search your library for a card. If it's an artifact, put it on the battlefield, otherwise put it into your hand. So you can go search for literally anything, but that's a 1 in 20 chance of that happening, and you also don't get to keep doing this. Overall, I think this card is really powerful. I mean, the worst thing that happens is you pay... I mean... Okay, I say it's really powerful. You are paying seven mana. So paying seven mana to lose three life, not great. But paying seven mana to, you know, create five treasure tokens, 
That seems fine. Gain three life, draw three cards. Seems fine. Tutor for something and put it right on the battlefield. That's fine, especially when you consider this is colorless and it's not seven mana all at once. Turn four, you could be searching your library for an artifact ca card and putting it right on the battlefield. Or creating five treasure tokens, which then pays for the cost of activating the treasure chest. Like, this seems really good, uh, but I'm not sure. I think that it is a little too luck dependent to maybe become meta, but I think that this could be a fun card to include in lots of different decks. Next, we have Icing Death, Frost Tyrant. It's a four cost white legendary creature dragon mythic for three with flying and vigilance. And when it dies, create Icing Death, Frost Tongue, and a legendary white equipment artifact token with equip creature gets plus two plus so oh. whenever equip creature attacks tap target creature defending player controls and equip two so essentially this is a four three flying vigilancer for a four not bad but when it dies you kind of get this nice little piece of uh, equipment so it almost reminds me of the white Kaldheim god i don't know why i'm blanking on his name today um where it's kind of both a big creature and an equipment but this one you have to kind of it almost feels like it was meant to be a double-faced card, and they decided, hey, let's instead just make this one card that turns into the other. It almost feels like a traditional um, single-faced card, or sorry, a traditional double-faced card, and but it's done through tokens, which I think is kind of uh, interesting. Next, we have a Flame Skull. It's one red red for a creature skeleton, 3-1 with flying, and it can't block. But when it dies, which is a little harder because it can't block, Exile it. If you do, exile the top card of your library. Until end of turn, until the end of your next turn, you may play one of those. So when this thing dies, essentially you're gonna exile the top card of your library, and until your next turn, you have the option to either play the card you exiled or replay Flame Skull. So Flame Skull can be this kind of creature that you can keep sacrificing, for instance, and as long as you can keep paying that three mana, you are going to be able to keep recasting it. Which means that you can then, you know keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. Um, and it's this card that kind of has this built-in recursion that can be very powerful. And it is a mythic. Uh, I do think this is pretty good. Uh, however, you do need to be in the right kind of deck that I think can sacrifice it for value. I mean, this technically can go infinite with anything that gives you mana when a creature dies. Um, it, it can do a lot of different things. I think that one's obviously a little more janky. But I do think that this can just generate you a decent amount of value. It's also a 3-1... Uh, for three with flying. So that does obviously have some implications as well. Next we have Den of the Bugbear, so it's another one in that cycle. So if you control two or more other lands, Den of the Burglar enters the battlefield tapped. So essentially you need to play this as your first or second land drop. And then you can tap to add it for red, to add red, sorry. And then you can pay four and it becomes a three, two red goblin with whenever this creature attacks, create a one, one red goblin that's a tapped and attacking. So this one seems really good. If you can manage to attack with it, you get some sort of permanent value compared to like the white one where it just had flying. However, getting the opportunity to attack with this one does seem more difficult. Um, we do seem to be getting a lot of lands that can turn into creatures, and I think that's a very appropriate way to deal with control decks because it makes it a much harder target to remove, uh, and it'll be interesting to see if this kind of lowers the prominence of those control-based decks. Either way, let's move on. Next we have Xanathar, Guild Kingpin. It's four uh, blue-black for a legendary creature, Beholder. It's a 5-6. It says, at the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent. Until end of turn, that player can't cast spells. You may look at the top card of their library anytime. You may play the top card of their library and may spend mana as though or mana of any color to cast spells this way. So essentially, you choose an opponent and the top of their library kind of becomes yours. Now, it does say you may play cards, meaning you can play their lands, you can cast their spells... This seems like a really, really good card. It almost always gets you at least one card of value uh, every single turn, and it can also stop your opponents from interacting with you. For instance, if there's one other blue deck at the table, you say, hey, you can't cast spells, and now I can combo off. So I think this is powerful on so many levels. It's a 5-6 six for 6. I think this is going to be one of the chase commanders from the set, where people are like, oh, this is a fun effect that I'd love to build my deck around, uh, and I think people are generally going to do that. 
Next, we have Sphere of Annihilation. It is X and a black for an artifact, and when it enters the battlefield, it enters with X void counters on it. The meaning of your upkeep, Exile Sphere of Annihilation, all creatures and all planeswalkers with mana value less than or equal to the number of void counters on it, and all creatures and all planeswalker cards in graveyards with mana value less than or equal to the number of void counters on it. Seems pretty good. I mean, you pay five, it becomes a six drop that then exiles itself and all creatures and planeswalkers with mana value five or less. But then again, does that sound good? I would almost rather just destroy everything, but then again, if you're in one of those decks that is going to cheat a lot of big stuff, maybe you can do something with this. It just, it seems a bit expensive for me. Um, I'm sure there are decks that will want to run it, especially those that can ramp up. But, and it does let you obviously, like, select how you want to board wipe. For instance, if your opponents are running to a token deck, you can pay one black mana and exile all their tokens. That seems pretty good to me. So I think this could be an interesting sideboard option against those more token or low to the ground strategies. I mean, imagine this for just two mana or for three mana total, you know, exile everything with mana value two or less. That's going to wipe out a lot of red decks. And I think that it could actually prove to be very useful. Next, we have Minion of the Mighty. It's a red one, zero one for one with Menace, and when it attacks, if you attacked with creatures with total power six or greater, so this is another pack tactic one, you can put a dragon creature card from your hand onto the battlefield tapped and attacking. Pretty crazy. Um, lots of really expensive dragons are currently in the game, and we're getting an influx of them with this set. I can't really judge this until I can see all the dragons in the set, because obviously that will impact the power level of it, but I know people have already found, like, turn two kills in standard, which I find to be really, really funny. Next, we have this card, which can be translated into Hall of the Storm Giants. It's a land, and if you control two or more other lands, it enters the battlefield tap, so essentially, gotta be your first or second land. And then, six mana, until end of turn, it becomes a 7-7 seven, seven blue giant creature token with Ward 3. It's still a land. So, Ward, pretty awesome. It means it's gonna be even harder to kill. I can see this being a really awesome tool against control. It's hard to kill with removal. It has to be instant speed removal, and they have to hold three extra mana up to do it. Unfortunately, it is kind of costing you seven mana to do, so you got to keep that in mind as well. Um, but I do think that this could be one of those cards you throw one or two of in your deck to kind of stop those more control a decks from being able to completely shut you down. Next, we have a Hive of the Eye Tyrant. It has the same tap clause, and it then taps for black, and it becomes a 3-3 black beholder creature with menace, and whenever this creature attacks, exile target card from defending player's graveyard. It's still a land. All right, this one seems really, really good to me. It can, you know, the advantage of these cards is that in a pinch, they can be a creature, but this in a pinch can also be a graveyard kind of hate card, and now it's worse, it's a tapped monocolor land, which isn't great, but it's also not like it's a card in your deck that's dedicated to removing you know, cards from opponent's graveyards. It is just your land, and if you need to, you can remove something from someone's graveyard. Even if the land ends up dying, it still can happen, and it can be one of those things where it's like, oh gosh, they're about to croak, so I need to exile this, and I think that can be really, really awesome. Next, we have this card, which can be translated into Terrasque. Terrasque? It's a six and a green, green, green for a legendary creature dinosaur 10-10, and it, when it enters the battlefield, if it was cast, it gains haste and ward 10 permanently. And then whenever it attacks, it fights target creature defending player control. So you're removing something as it attacks. It has haste, so it's attacking the turn it comes down, and it has ward 10. Now, if this thing gets cheated into play, it's still a 10-10 that whenever it attacks, it fights something. But it is infinitely easier to remove and does not attack the turn of, which then makes it easier to remove. I actually like how this was balanced. It's like if you're manually casting this by ramping up to big numbers, it's this big, immediate, hexproof, basically, threat. But when you are attacking, or but when you're cheating it out, it's still this big thing, but it's way more interactable, which is what needs to happen for those reanimator decks to be stopped, is you have to interact with what they're doing. Next, we have this card, which is Ter Tresalara, Moon Dancer. It's a green and a white for a legendary creature, Elf Cleric. And whenever you gain life, put a counter on it and scry 1, 2-2. Two, two. So it just seems like a typical, like, I'm going to be your commander for a Selesnia life gain deck. It's not my favorite. If it said you gain that much, I think it could be interesting, especially if they pushed it up a few mana value levels. But this just feels like a legendary a Johnny's Pride mate with a scry attached to it. So it's just not my favorite. And that is it for this video. I know it's been a long one, but I hope you guys enjoyed. I will be back tomorrow with more spoilers and more details regarding Dungeons & Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.